Race cars. They're fast, loud, expensive, and usually European. Every car that's won the 24 hours of Le Mans outright has been European. The Porsche 919 from Germany, the Peugeot 908 from France, the Ferrari 499P from Italy, the Ford GT40, Mazda 787B, and Jaguar XJR9 from the UK. Europe has a 100% win rate at the 24 hours of Le Mans. But that's not to say the others haven't tried. This takes our story to the incorrect side of the Atlantic, to a country called the United States of America. For those who haven't heard of the United States of America, it's a country in North America where things are done a little bit differently. An American president described it this way. America is a nation that can be defined in a single word. I was in the foot, uh, foot, foot, excuse me, the foothills of the Himalayas with Xi Jinping, traveling with them. I guess we traveled 17,000 miles when I was vice president. I don't know that for a fact. And I agree with that entirely. But to those of us who live in conventional countries, the USA is a source of great puzzlement. They use different units of measurement, they eat different food, and they even speak a different sort of English. It's certainly an unusual place that often leaves us feeling confused, but they also make a lot of cars, and that's what we're all here for. As you'd expect, their cars are also a little unusual. Just look at any panels. I'll certainly make a few videos on panels. But that's not what we're looking at today, because today's subject is Cadillac. Cadillac is a brand without a particularly good reputation. It was aimed at competing with Mercedes, BMW and Audi, but they didn't appeal to mainstream buyers. Even in the US, the average Cadillac buyer was 832 years old. The other half of Cadillac buyers were much older than that. Most Cadillac buyers have fond memories of World War I. The trouble with having such an old customer base is that old people have a bit of a tendency to not continue living. Having a customer base constantly finding themselves no longer alive isn't good for business, and Cadillac was suffering in sales as a result. They needed to find some new customers. As a result, a group of GM executives met in wherever GM's headquarters are and had a discussion. One of these executives brought something called a world map to this meeting. This map had all sorts of interesting places that General Motors executives had never heard of. One of these places was called Europe. The GM executives were immediately fascinated by this as it seemed to have a lot of people and those people also had money to buy cars. General Motors already owned two brands in Europe, Opel and Vauxhall. GM would buy another European brand in Saab, but would also make an attempt at launching their American brands in Europe. The channel Ed's Auto Reviews made a good video about this that I'll link in the description. But the important thing to note is that one of these brands was Cadillac. Cadillac was to be GM's flagship brand in both the American and European market, but the image problem for them still persisted, and in the European market, it was even more pronounced. General Motors sold Cadillacs as luxury cars, but European buyers saw them as poorly built, uncomfortable depreciation sinks that were as interesting as a Toyota Camry and as sensible as a Corvette. A badly made, listen. Just yeah, sound heard, that sounds like a wheelie bin. Yeah. <laughs> Plastic wheelie yeah. bin. Yeah. Uh, badly made out of very, very cheap materials. GM realised they couldn't compete with the Germans on luxury, so they decided to reframe the brand as a more sporty and performance oriented brand. For the European market, they even offered manual gearboxes. That's right, you could have a Cadillac estate car with a manual gearbox. But manual gearboxes alone don't give a brand the image of high performance. The way you do that is by going racing. And that's exactly what Cadillac did. Autonomy is an illusion.
GM's first taste of Le Mans prototypes came in 1997. The Riley and Scott Mark III was available with a GM V8 badged by the brand Oldsmobile. Something which made me think, what in the world is an Oldsmobile? Are they just making up brands at this point or what? I cannot name a single car Oldsmobile has ever made, nor have I ever seen one in my life. Besides from the fact that the car was powered by an engine from a brand that seemingly only exists in the imaginations of General Motors top brass, the Riley and Scott Mark III is important to the story here, because it would be this car that would be the basis for the Cadillac Northstar LMP. Riley and Scott would be the chassis constructor for the Northstar, presumably with Riley building the front of the car and Scott doing the back of it. The car would debut at the 2000 Daytona 24 hours. It would feature a silver livery and to show how much of a young audience Cadillac wanted to capture the attention of, they were sponsored by Toshiba photocopiers and fax machines. To be fair, it was 2000 and fax was still a common method of communication, but it was already on the way out. What's not on the way out though is this YouTube feature you'll want to try, which will make this video even better to watch. First, take the video out of full screen. Now, subscribe to the channel. Then you can put it back in full screen. Anyway, back to the video. The slick livery may have given the impression of a car ready to tame the steep bankings of Daytona, but problems immediately arose for the pair of North Stars. It was slower than the old Riley and Scott Mark III entered by Dyson Racing, presumably powered by some sort of vacuum cleaner, which took pole position. Cadillacs finished 13th and 14th. Not exactly the result they were hoping for. However, given the fact that it was the car's debut event, it's not the worst result possible. New cars often have teething problems. The teams need to learn how to best set up the car, and the 24 hours of Daytona, although a relatively prestigious race in its own right, is somewhat of a test event for the 24 hours of Le Mans. That's the real jewel in the crown. It's the one you really want to win. For the race, Cadillac would bring two cars, whilst the French team Dams would also bring two Cadillac Northstar LMPs of their own. The recent exodus of many manufacturers in the sports car racing meant competition would not be particularly strong for the Cadillac. There was only one other car manufacturer on the grid, with the rest of the cars being from independent teams. Unfortunately for Cadillac, this car manufacturer they'd be up against was called Audi, and their car, the R8 LMP, was one of the most legendary cars ever to grace the historic French tarmac. On the road, Cadillac could not compete with German luxury cars, but on the track, could they beat German race cars? Qualifying would answer this question. There were four Cadillacs and three Audis entered into the race. Pole position would go to Audi, as would second and third. The highest placed Cadillac was ninth, behind multiple cars from independent teams. In fact, it wasn't even the highest placed American car on the grid. The Panos LMP1, which qualified fourth, would take that honour. To add insult to injury, it wasn't even close. The Dams car was over six seconds per lap slower than the Audi R8. This is not what Cadillac wanted. They needed a miracle if they wanted to go well at Le Mans. Starting well down the order, isn't such a big deal. This is the 24 hours of Le Mans. Grid position doesn't mean anything. What's more concerning is the six seconds per lap pace deficit to the Audis. As the race started, predictably, the Audis easily broke away from the chasing pack with only the Panos 
keeping in visual range of the Audis by the end of lap one. But it would not be long before the Audis were well out of sight of any other car. Meanwhile, the Cadillacs behind failed to make much of an impression in the opening stages of the race, but it wouldn't be long before Cadillac's fortunes would change. One of them from the Privateer Dams team decided to provide some additional entertainment to the fans by exploding. This was not good for the car's pace, but at least they managed to get a bit of screen time this way. The factory Cadillacs would not fare much better. Both would experience mechanical issues and drop well down the order. But overnight, the field began to experience high attrition, and this trend continued well into the morning. Reliability issues would even affect the impeccable Audi team, but Audi's clever engineering meant they could change a gearbox in as little as four minutes. This meant that despite the fact that two of the three R8s experienced a gearbox failure, they simply came back to the pits, changed it, and returned to the race without losing position to any other manufacturer. The result being that by the morning, the podium spots were still Audi, Audi, Audi. A phrase that would become very familiar to sports car racing viewers over the next 15 years. As the LMP 900 field continued to shrink one by one, one of the dam's Cadillacs found itself all the way up in fourth position. Unfortunately for Cadillac, the suspension collapsed on this car, dropping it to 19th position, making it still the best placed Cadillac at the end of the race. Le Mans 2000 was an embarrassment for Cadillac. They turned up in Le Mans with aspirations of beating the mighty Audis, but Audi didn't even realise Cadillac was in the same race as them. They were already taunted by the German manufacturers on the roads beating them in sales, and now they were also comprehensively beaten on the track. For 2001, Cadillac knew they'd need a faster car if they wanted to win Le Mans. They would continue to use a chassis from Riley and Scott, but a newly established firm in the UK headed by Nigel Stroot would design new bodywork for the car. Cadillac hoped that with a bit of help from the British, they could challenge Audi. But in 2001, only the Dams team entered with Cadillacs, with the best placed car finishing 51 laps behind the race winning Audis, with the Audi team again scoring a 1-2, with the Bentley Speed 8, a car based on the Audi R8, finishing third. The car needed even more work. This meant that for 2002, Cadillac decided to have the British firm build the whole car. This meant that much like the Ford GT40, the 2002 iteration of the Cadillac Northstar LMP was actually entirely British, with the exception of the American engine, which came from America. The new British Cadillac was more competitive than its predecessor, with the factory team returning to qualify 8th and 10th, with the number 7 car only 3.5 seconds per lap slower than the pole seating Audi. The race wouldn't prove fruitful though. Cadillac would score their first ever top 10 with a number 6 finishing 9th, but they were still 30 laps behind the winning Audi. Audi would again score a 1-2-3 in 2002, with a sole Bentley Speed 8 finishing the race in 4th. At the end of 2002, Cadillac would axe the North Star LMP program, with the car having failed to achieve anything of note. But why did the North Star fail? The main reason is just how outdated it was. In 1997, most prototypes used a similar sort of bodywork design as the Riley and Scott Mark III. But by 2000, prototypes were going in a new direction, where they began to have bodywork much more like Formula One cars. On modern prototypes, such as the Porsche 919 you're seeing right here, this philosophy has been taken to the max. Although it's not immediately apparent when you look at it from a distance, up close, it has a front wing and side pods just like a Formula One car, although they're quite hidden. The Audi R18 in 2016 took this even further with a Formula One style nose cone. Back to the early 2000s, and although the cars hadn't gone quite as far as the later LMP1s with the F1 style bodywork, it was this era when this concept began to become the big trend of prototype race car design. The Audi R8 LMP featured a raised and pointed nose cone, whilst the Cadillac had a much more conventional design, more similar to the 1980s Porsche 962. In fact, 
it even initially had a functioning front grille. They did eventually move to the high nose concept, but this was only in the car's third year, meaning Audi already had three years of development with the high nose concept. The rear wing was very much the same story. It was mounted low and had a long cord and was a double element wing. Audi had a high mounted, higher aspect ratio single element wing. The reason that Audi could effectively have a smaller wing was that mounting it up high puts the wing out of the car's own turbulence, making it more efficient. The Cadillac needed a bigger wing because it wasn't up in the clean air. The car's name gives another clue as to why it was slow, Northstar. It was named after its engine, the General Motors Northstar V8. What's that, you ask? It's a family of engines fitted to Cadillac street cars. That's right. This LMP900 car had a production-based engine. This made it essentially worse in every measurable way than the purpose-built race engine used in the Audi and Bentley. It was heavier, less powerful, and used more fuel. In addition to this, in Le Mans prototypes, the engine is a structural part of the car, meaning torsional rigidity is also important, something race car engines generally have much more of than street engines. You add all of this up, and you get an aerodynamically inefficient, underpowered, floppy underperformer. But where does this put the North Star on the failed race's super scoreboard? In terms of the cool factor, it's a Cadillac. It may be a Le Mans prototype, but it's a Le Mans prototype for people who were too old to have fought in World War I. It was also sponsored by a manufacturer of photocopiers and fax machines. Is there anything in the world less cool than photocopiers and fax machines? The North Star gets a 2 out of 10 for the cool factor. The silver and black livery was boring and the bodywork looked quite clunky. Admittedly, the 2002 version did look alright, but it's nothing to write home about. It gets a 4 out of 10 for the aesthetics. The car really didn't have that much potential. It was always an uphill battle. An inexperienced manufacturer going up against the titans of sports car racing in the form of Audi is not easy. The car's concepts just didn't have much in it. This gives it a 4 out of 10 for potential. The car started out in life using an ancient chassis and was obsolete from day one. The later iterations started to catch up with the latest features in LMP900, but it was always playing catch up. The Cadillac gets a 2 out of 10 for innovation. The gap between expectations and reality was not particularly big. There wasn't much hype surrounding the Cadillac. The car was not expected to perform well, and it didn't. 4 out of 10. The Cadillac did have a real chance of an against the odds performance in 2000, with a car running in 4th in the late stages of the race, despite a 6.5 second per lap pace deficit. But the suspension did collapse. And the result of that is what we saw. Cadillac gets a 5 out of 10. That gives the Caddy an overall score of 3.5 out of 10, making it the lowest scoring car on the Super Scoreboard. Make sure to subscribe to the channel to check out next week's video, which will be explaining where the FIA's letter groups, that's Group A, Group B, Group C, and Group N, went.